Good afternoon. We start with portfolio questions um, on justice. The question number one, Maurice Golden. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when the Cabinet Secretary for Justice last met Police Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Michael Mathis. I meet regularly with representatives of Police Scotland and met the Chief Constable on the 7th of September to discuss a range of issues. Maurice Golden. The harm to Scottish businesses and communities in relation to metal theft is well documented and indeed recognised in this chamber. With 417 metal related crimes reported between April and July this year, equating to £600,000 repair bill. However, how are Police Scotland prioritising other environmental crime? such as illegal waste sites, illegal waste exports and fly tipping, and how are they linking with key stakeholders such as SEPA? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as the member will recognise, the decision on how the police prioritise these types of issues is an operational matter for the Chief Constable and for local commanders. Um, he'll be aware that we have taken forward new legislation in the last parliamentary session in order to tighten regulations in the law around matters relating to metal dealers and to ensure that there is a proper regime in place to minimise the risk of uh, metal theft finding its way into uh, scrap metal dealers in Scotland. Uh, and those uh, uh, measures are starting to come into force across the country at the present moment. Just in September itself, uh, the new requirement for any payments to be made through a bank account uh, uh, came into uh, force. With regards to the other specific aspects, if the uh, member has a concern about how the police are handling any particular issue within his own region or constituency area, um, he is at liberty to discuss that matter with the local commander if he's concerned about the way in which they are prioritising these issues. But by and large, my experience with uh, police, uh, the police service in my own constituency is that where there is a concern about an environmental matter, where there is a concern about some type of issue about illegal dumping, is that the partnership between the local authority and the police is absolutely essential in being able to deal with these issues effectively, whether that be through the different means that the council have, through covert means as well, uh, in order to uh, try and catch those who are dumping uh, items illegally. There's a range of measures that can be taken forward by the local authority working in partnership with the police. So there are powers out there that can be utilised, uh, but the way in which they are handled at a localised level, as a member will recognise, is an operational matter uh, for the local commander. And if he does have any specific issues about how that's been taken forward within his own uh, particular uh, region, uh, he should uh, discuss that matter with the local commander and they can explain that whole issue and discuss that issue in much greater depth. Claire Baker. Thank you, President Officer. Last week, the Courier newspaper reported a police whistleblower saying morale among officers in Fife is dreadful and that the number of staff able to respond to incidents has been decimated. It also reported concerns that the force came close to not being able to pay salaries in recent months. The attitude to concerns raised so far has not been good enough. Does the Cabinet Secretary recognise these claims from serving officers, officers who are dedicated to the force but are working under increasingly difficult circumstances, and how will the Government respond to the continuing concerns over the police budget? Cabinet Secretary. Well, let me deal with the issue of salaries, because the response from Police Scotland was very clear on the issue of salaries when it stated that it was untrue. Uh, which I think is pretty unequivocal in terms of responding to that particular uh, suggestion. So the member may choose not to accept that or not, but that's the reality of what Police Scotland said and the Scottish Police Authority said. It's simply not true. So that's pretty unequivocal. On the issue of morale, the member will be aware that Police Scotland conducted their first staff survey in order to establish a baseline of a whole range of issues that were matters of concern or how the service was responding to issues of concern which were raised by uh, officers within the service and to look at how they could improve on that. What the Scottish Police Authority stated is that what they would then do is then take forward an action plan in order to address these types of issues that had been raised as matters of concern or where they saw there was room for further improvement. And over the next two years, that's what the SPA along with Police Scotland are going to be taking forward. What they've also said they will do is they will also take out, they will also undertake some dip sampling. So during the course of the year, they will then sample a number of officers to see whether in specific areas, whether the measures which they are taking are addressing the concerns and issues that have been raised by them. And there's ongoing work to try and address these issues. So what I can give the member an assurance of is that um, I'm not disputing that there will be officers who uh, may not uh, be happy with how things are going within the, the particular area in which they are operating at the present time. 
That would be the case in any big organisation of any uh, nature, particularly an organisation that has gone through a significant level of change, as has been the case with uh, the police service in Scotland. But equally, I can give the member an assurance of the commitment that Police Scotland and the SPA have to trying to address some of these issues as and when they are raised. And the way in which they're doing that is through the exercise that they've had in asking for officers on their views on how the service is performing and then looking at how they can address the issues that have been highlighted as part of that staff survey. Ben McPherson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact Police Scotland's Disclosure Scheme for Domestic Abuse, or Clare's Law, is having in tackling the scourge of domestic abuse. Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, we had a very worthwhile debate here last week on the proposed new offence for domestic abuse in Scotland. As uh, all members, I'm sure, will be united in uh, recognising there is no place for domestic abuse in uh, Scottish society. Uh, the Police Scotland Disclosure Scheme for Domestic Abuse is one of a number of interventions which are being taken forward in order to help to eradicate uh, domestic abuse from our society. Uh, the Disclosure Scheme has been ruled out now right across uh, Scotland. Uh, since that has happened, there have been 926 applications during the period of the 1st October 2015 until the 1st of September this year. And from those, 391 applications have resulted in information being provided to a person of a person potentially at risk of abuse. There is no doubt in my mind, my mind President Officer, that this is a very valuable uh, scheme which Police Scotland are operating. And the figures in themselves over the last year just demonstrate the value that it has in helping to prevent the possibility of individuals being exposed to domestic violence. And I know that Police Scotland are committed to continuing to respond to requests which they receive for access through this scheme. And they will consider every case on an individual basis. Liam MacArthur. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be well aware of the reports last week uh, that eight police stations in Dumfries and Galloway are under threat of closure, with echoes uh, of the earlier closure of countless police counters across Scotland. Uh, police Scotland have said the move in Dumfries and Galloway is part of a wider look at resources across Scotland. Uh, what assurances can the Cabinet Secretary give this Parliament that local police stations across Scotland will not face similar threats of closure? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the member may be aware, or unless he's not, of the more detail which Police Scotland have given regarding these proposals. What they are doing is they are consulting and engaging with the local community on proposed changes to the use of these police stations within the Dumfries and Galloway area. There is a number of the stations in which they have at the present moment which are either not fit for purpose or are too large for uh, their use that they are looking at forming partnerships with other public bodies, whether it be the local authority, health partners, housing association, to try and identify more suitable solutions in order to continue to deliver uh, some form of service within these particular areas. There's a number of these stations don't presently have counter services and haven't had for some time in the first place. So what I'd say to the member, although I recognise it's a slight distance from his own constituency in Dumfries and Galloway, what they're uh, intending to do here is to consult with the local community on proposed changes of use to these particular facilities. That could, as has happened in my constituency, where a particular police station that didn't have a counter facility, that was of limited use to the police, closed, but they moved the police service into beside the housing department within the local community. It's now providing a much better service. It now has a counter service that's delivered locally. It's actually enhanced the delivery of the service, although technically there is no longer a police station in the place where it actually was. So there are a number of ways in which we can enhance the way in which the police are engaging with other public bodies within our local areas, working in partnership closely together. That can involve sharing premises, and part of the work which they're doing in Dumfries and Galloway is exploring these matters and engaging. And I've got no doubt that those members who represent that area, who's here today, will seek to be involved in that process. And the decisions on these matters will be taken by the local commander. So the decision on what action is taken will be a matter for the local commander within that local area following that consultation and that engagement process. I would have hoped given that the member has, over the last couple of years, called for more local decision-making in these matters, would welcome that type of approach to ensure that it's not been taken at a central level within the organisation or by the Scottish Police Authority itself, but been taken by local commanders following engagement with the local community. Uh, Neil Findlay. When he last met uh, Police Scotland, did he discuss the uh, historic undercover 
policing scandal? And will the Cabinet Secretary now instruct a Scottish inquiry into the whole issue of uh, undercover policing in Scotland? Representatives from all parties in this Parliament support that call, does he? Cabinet Secretary. Well, briefly, if at all possible, Cabinet Secretary. As I've said, uh, President Officer, I always discuss a range of different issues when I uh, meet with representatives from uh, Police Scotland. I'm uh, well aware of the members' uh, repeated call for uh, the Pitchford inquiry to also apply here in Scotland. I uh, share his disappointment at the UK Government's refusal to do so because that was the most effective and most reasonable way in which to deal with the concerns relating to the activities of undercover units from the Metropolitan Police Service in London. And what I will now do is I want to consider what response we will make to that here in Scotland, and I will set that out in due course. Question number two, Mark Ruskell. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to detect, prevent and prosecute dog fighting offences. Minister Annabel Ewing. The Scottish Government supports the vital role of the Scottish Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals and the Police in dealing with organised dog fighting. Scottish Ministers have granted authorised inspectors uh, from the SSPCA with the same powers as local authority inspectors in relation to animal welfare offences under the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act 2006. Mm. These powers differ only from those of police constables in relation to the arrest of an offender. Dog fighting is a largely clandestine activity and detection by enforcement bodies is greatly dependent upon information supplied by concerned members of the public. The prosecution of all offences reported to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service is a matter for that agency. Mark Russell. Can I thank the Minister for that response? I think it's quite clear that we do need to redouble efforts in Scotland. The SSPCA, SSPCA have reported to us that, for example, the police have only successfully prosecuted one individual for dog fighting since 1991. We know that there's a particular link in Scotland to the activities of criminal gangs. So would the Scottish Government consider setting up a task force on animal fighting to share information, track those who've been convicted of animal abuse in the past, and help bring more cases to conviction? Minister. Um, well, I've listened to what the member has said. What I, I would say, of course, and what I, I, I mentioned in my first uh, response was that uh, detection is of such a highly secretive crime is largely dependent upon uh, people coming forward. And we would always encourage people with relevant information to make that known to the police and the SSPCA. Uh, in fact, in, in the period 2013 to 2016, uh, there was only one case uh, involving dog fighting dogs reported to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal <coughs> Service. Uh, that I understand led to a successful prosecution and a conviction uh, was forthcoming. Uh, I, I think we may await sentencing at this stage and obviously that's a matter for the independent judiciary. Uh, but if, if the member uh, wishes to bring to us uh, further information uh, of relevance, obviously we'll be very happy to look at it. Oliver Mundell. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. To ask the Minister if she'll join with me in welcoming the presence of the Dogs Trust today in Parliament and set out what action the Scottish Government is taking to tackle illegal dog breeding. Yeah, this is more about dog fighting than dog breeding. Yes. The Minister can respond very briefly. Uh, well, I, I welcome all uh, groups who come to the Parliament to seek to uh, uh, communicate with uh, 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 MSPs, and I welcome the Dog Trust in that respect. Uh, I actually will be meeting in, in a, with my capacity as an individual MSP with the Dogs Trust uh, during the course of the week, and obviously I'll listen to anything that they have to see on the subject that the member raised. Thank you, Minister. Number three, question number three, Maurice Corry. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how it will fill the reported £21 million cash shortfall faced by Police Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government is in regular contact with the Scottish Police Authority, which is taking steps to manage the in-year financial position. Maurice Corry. Uh, thank you, Minister, for your reply to my first question. Recently, a statement by a whistleblower from within Police Scotland was published by the Scottish Police Federation, which said that police officers, and I quote, are being told not to be proactive and investigate drug, drug dealers because they could cause overtime, close quote. Can the Minister tell me why police officers are being stopped from incurring overtime in their fight against drug dealers? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as a member may be aware, Police Scotland responded to that matter and said there is no ban on overtime. Uh, Christine Graham. 
uh, I have asked the Cabinet Secretary that perhaps he would advise uh, Mr Corrie that so far the UK has kept £72 million in VAT levied on Police Scotland, the only police force in the whole of the UK to have VAT levied. And given that the UK has now granted VAT exemption to academy schools, which previously paid it, this doesn't just seem to me to be perverse, but to in fact to be punitive. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think the member does raise a reasonable point, although it did raise some murmuring from our colleagues in the Conservative benches, because it seems to be that when it comes to allowing uh, the recovery of VAT, there are double standards in the way in which Her Majesty's Treasury in London operate. They chose to change the law, the VAT law, to allow academy schools, which are centrally funded by the UK government, to be able to recover VAT, but they've chosen not to for Police Scotland, which means that we, are the, we have the only force in the UK that is unable to recover VAT. And since Police Scotland has been established, that has caused the Scottish taxpayer £76.5 million, almost, uh, and almost 20, between £25 and £30 million per year. In addition to that, there's also an extra £10 million which is uh, afforded to the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. So I think it is perfectly reasonable that Police Scotland should be treated on an equal footing with other police services within the UK, including national forces like the PSNI, and as a centrally funded organisation in the same way that academy schools are, okay, and the HM, uh, Her Majesty's Treasury should recognise that this discriminatory approach against Police Scotland is simply unacceptable. Maybe the members on that side will stand up for Police Scotland rather than just doing the bidding work of their colleagues at Westminster. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Will the Justice Secretary accept that the cost-cutting proposals from Police Scotland to close eight police stations in Dumfries and Galloway on the back of the closure of the police control room, the scrapping of traffic wardens, the closure of public counters in numerous police stations, the cut in opening hours and the massive cull in civilian staff posts will be a further erosion of services to the people of Dumfries and Galloway? And will he acknowledge that his peripheral, largely rural regions in areas such as the south of Scotland that lose out most as a result of the government's obsession with centralising police services. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I mentioned to uh, the colleague, the member who asked the question earlier on regarding Dumfries and Galloway, the decision around any changes to the use of police stations in that particular area will be a matter for the local commander. Uh, this is a consultation exercise which is undertaken with the local community and with local stakeholders, including the member if he wishes to participate in that process. And it will take place over the next three to four months. It's an opportunity for the police service to look at where there are better ways in which they can use the resources. So, for example, where it's looking at shared services with other parts of the public sector in order to bring them closer together to make sure they've got stronger partnerships. That's one of the options which they wish to look at. So I think it's an opportunity to look at shaping the service to make sure that it's able to meet local demands within the Dumfries and Galloway community. And I'm sure the member will welcome the fact that decisions in this matter with the oversight of the Scottish Police Authority will be made by the local commander. A criticism that was made in the past about changes where local commanders were not able to make these decisions it was often voiced in this parliament. This time round, Police Scotland are doing exactly that with oversight from the Scottish Police Authority. And I would have thought the member would welcome that type of local approach. Question number four, Edward Mountain. To ask the Scottish Government whether it considers the proposed location of the new Highland Prison is the most appropriate site. Cabinet Secretary. On the 27th of June 2016, the Scottish Prison Service announced that they were pausing the planning consultation process on the proposed site at Milton of Lees to ascertain if a viable alternative option for the location of the replacement of HMP Inverness was available elsewhere. Following discussions with the owner of the Milton of Lees site, a proposed alternative site was brought forward, which had not been previously available as a potential prison site. A full assessment is currently being undertaken, and we anticipate an outcome within the next three or four months. Edward Mountain. May I firstly welcome all the work that's being done, done by the Governor and her team at Porterfield Prison at the moment, making use of very limited and outdated facilities. Turning back to the situation, there were 12 sites originally proposed. The consultants who looked at this used a traffic light system. Seven were classed as red, and for those that don't understand, that's a no-go. Four as amber, which were, have potential but were not perfect, 
and one was green. Despite having made three requests to meet with the chief executive of SPS, who originally said he would meet me, and then has subsequently refused twice, why was a red site selected originally and the only green site considered after a local outcry on the decision that had been made? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think the member uh, should recognise that the Scottish Prison Service have chosen to pause the uh, original uh, approach that they were intending to take uh, in the Inverness area and are presently exploring options with uh, a site that previously was not available to them as a possible site for building a new establish within, establishment within the Inverness city area. I'm sure the member would also recognise, I don't know if he was in the recent visit to uh, HMP uh, Inverness to have a look at the existing conditions and would recognise that there are conditions which are unacceptable both for staff and for prisoners and require to be replaced. That's why we are determined to make sure that there is a new prison within the Inverness city area in order to service the Highlands and Islands. And once this assessment process has been completed on the new site that has come, into, uh, come, into, uh, has come along as an option, we'll then be in a, a position where we can make a final decision on what is the appropriate choice for the replacement of the existing establishment in Inverness. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Apologies to members. I couldn't take any more supplementaries or make further progress there. We move on to culture, tourism and external affairs questions. Question number one, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its participation in the Brexit negotiations. Uh, Minister Michael Russell. Um, at this point, formal negotiations between the Scottish Government and the UK Government concerning Scotland's place in Europe have not yet commenced. The Prime Minister has undertaken that the Scottish Government will be fully involved in preparations for the forthcoming negotiations with the EU. Scottish Government officials have been in talks with the UK Government to establish how this commitment can be delivered in practice. To that end, I met with the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union on Thursday last week for an initial discussion. Progress in establishing a formal mechanism for Scotland's proper involvement has been slow, but we hope to inform Parliament about an agreed format shortly. Of course, I will undertake to regularly update members as negotiations begin uh, in line with the government's commitment to report regularly to Parliament and to its European and External Relations Committee. Claire Adamson. Can I thank the Minister for his response and welcome him to his post. During the Scottish independence referendum campaign, David Cameron said, we are a family, the United Kingdom is not one nation, we are four nations in a single country. Does the Minister agree that as Scotland voted to remain within the family of European nations, that that position is legitimate and should be respected during the Brexit negotiations? Minister. I very much agree with that because before the referendum, the Scottish Government had consistently argued for a quadruple lock for the UK, UK, U, EU referendum bill in order to make sure that the will of all the nations of these islands was reflected. Now, the UK Government ignored that request and has now put the people of Scotland and Northern Ireland, as well as the people of London, the people of Gibraltar, into a position to be possibly taken out of the EU against their democratic will. The First Minister has previously outlined it's imperative that the democratic will of the Scottish people is reflected in its future relationship with Europe. And the Scottish Government will consider all options, as this chamber asked it to, to respect the vote of the Scottish people to remain part of the European Union. To that end, uh, we will hold the UK Government to its promise that the Scottish Government be given a meaningful role in the UK Government negotiations with the EU in order to reflect our specific and devolved interests. Jackson Carlo. Um, the Minister said that in his meeting with the uh, Secretary of State, uh, progress was slow, but did he discern from that in the agreement that he hopes to reach when thereafter there might be a commencement of discussions in which the Scottish Government would participate? And will he confirm that it is the Scottish Government's intention to make every possible success of those discussions on behalf of Scotland and not to seek in any churlish way to scupper them in an attempt to try and justify a second independence referendum? Minister. Well, uh, Mr. Mr. Carlard displays his obsession with independence. Again, it is, I would advise the Tories to, to really try and get over it and to treat this in the same way as this, these benches are treating it, which is in a positive and engaged way. I am, more than, I am more than willing to say that I enter into any possible discussions uh, wholeheartedly and with a commitment to make them succeed. 
I would hope that I would hear the same from the UK government, because the UK government will have to respect the devolved competencies that exist, the interests that exist in Scotland, and the need for Scotland to be, in the words of the Prime Minister, fully involved and fully engaged. I'll make the commitment. I expect to see it from the UK too. Question number two, June McAlpine. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what engagement it is having with the cultural sector regarding the impact of Brexit on the arts. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. The Scottish Government is discussing Brexit with uh, Scotland's key cultural bodies and engaging with sectoral initiatives. I've asked the cultural and historic environment bodies sponsored and funded by the Scottish Government to assess the range of potential impacts, in particular to be sensitive to the impact on their own employees who come from other EU member states. Freedom of movement is of key importance for the cultural sector in particular. Uh, Creative Scotland have conducted a survey open to the cultural sector seeking information on potential impacts and have submitted the results of that survey to the European External Relations Committee's call for evidence. Joan McAlpine. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware of concerns outlined by the group Culture Counts that raise concerns that cultural organisations elsewhere in the EU may be reluctant to partner UK and Scottish cultural organisations in funding applications? Uh, yes, I am, and it is of, of deep concern. <laughs> Clearly, we haven't even started Brexit. We're uh, examining, obviously, the, the processes, and we don't even know the form that Brexit will take. Uh, currently, uh, there are 21 organisations involved in Creative Europe projects worth £8.2 million. And it's very important to remember that until... Uh, the UK leaves, it's still within the EU, and it's really important that those networks and relationships can continue. You can measure exports and uh, imports. Uh, one of the areas of concern, however, is how you measure lost opportunities uh, because of concerns about relationships. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. The Cabinet Secretary will also be aware of the importance to Scottish arts and culture of the audio Audiovisual Media Services Directive, which, applies, which provides shared regulation not just among European Union countries, but also other member states of the European Economic Area, which are right with the EU. Can she tell us whether the Scottish Government is engaging currently with the arts and cultural sector in order to identify how those uh, advantages can be protected, particularly given that the directive is currently uh, in the process of review? Uh, indeed, I've already spoken to the Creative Industries Federation on precisely that point. I've attended and led for the UK previously uh, in discussions on the digital single market and the audiovisual uh, regulations. And clearly, um, the relationship will change because the UK will not be part of those discussions. And so therefore, the issue will be what are the opportunities for Scotland, but more importantly, in terms of uh, the fact that UK and indeed Scotland would have been chief beneficiaries of such a move to a digital single market. The impact of that is not just currently of what is lost now, but what might be lost in the future. <coughs> Question number three, John Lamond. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with Visit Northumberland, Visit Cumbria and local authorities regarding promoting cross-border tourism. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, there's a clear mutual interest for cross-border collaboration as well as the long-standing informal linkages between Visit Scotland and relevant tourism bodies in the north of England. The Scottish Government understand that uh, Carlisle City Council, Cumbria County Council, Northumbria County Council, Dumfries and Galloway uh, Council and Scottish Borders Council continue to work together to develop cross border tourism as they build on the Borderlands initiative. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary um, for that answer and I'm pleased that she made mention to the Borderlands um, initiative. One of the strands of this initiative is to um, build and promote the Borderlands as a tourist destination and after an encouraging start there's a feeling amongst some stakeholders that progress has stalled. To date no strategy or development plan has been published. I acknowledge that to move this forward requires the cooperation of both the UK and Scottish governments as well as local councils and the Scotland office has confirmed with me that they share my desire to move this initiative forward. So does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the Scottish Borders has a lot to offer as a tourist destination and will she pledge to do more to promote cross-border cooperation on tourism? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, with my new responsibilities for tourism, I will take a close uh, interest in both the borders and the south of Scotland in terms of tourism. And I'm also due to meet with the other tourism ministers from across the UK, and I'll ensure that that is uh, an item that we can perhaps discuss at that meeting with their agreement. Question number four, Mike Grumbles. <clears throat> to ask the Scottish Government whether the Standing Council on Europe plans to publish a report on Scotland's relationship with the EU and, if so, when? 
Minister Mike Russell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Standing Council of Europe, which has now met in plenary on two occasions, is providing ongoing advice to the First Minister and other ministers. The Scottish Government is determined to protect our place in Europe and will explore op all options to do so. The Standing Council are therefore undertaking work on the options available to Scotland for our future relationship with the EU. Whilst this work is informing a negotiating position, so elements are obviously confidential, I'm committed to sharing as much of this publicly as early as I can. The Standing Council is also engaging widely with a range of individuals and organisations to further develop our understanding of the detail of our relationship with the EU in a range of fields. Through this process, information is being shared and views gathered as openly as possible across a range of topics, the environment, human rights, higher and further education only being examples. I grumbles. Well, I commend the government for its forward thinking in setting this up, um, especially looking at options. But however, in committee this morning, I asked the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy if he had set up a team of civil servants to design options for our Scottish system of farm payments for post-2020 after we've left the EU, because this is entirely devolved. From his response, it turns out that he has done absolutely no forward thinking on this subject whatsoever. Will the Minister encourage Fergus Ewing to put his thinking cap on? Minister. Well, I would encourage everybody to put their thinking cap on. It'd be nice to see a thinking cap on the Liberal Democrats, if that's not uh, uh, something that baffles one. I'd like to see a thinking cap on the ministers in the UK government. But it is important that we all consider the range of options. I have to say, I found Fergus Ewing to be very forward-thinking in these matters. The first event that I, the first event I attended that organised for stakeholders was one that he has attended. He has another event this week, I think, in Moffat on Friday in the forestry sector. He is talking to the sectors. He is looking at the potential that those sectors have. He is trying to come to some conclusions. It won't all be done in an afternoon, even if the Lib Dems think it can be. Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. I understand that the Standing Council recently considered the impact of Brexit on human rights and social protections. Does the Cabinet Minister agree that, as, as legislation in these areas is reserved, there is a very real risk that advances made in these areas could be threatened? Minister. Uh, that is a, a very important point, and I do agree with the member. Uh, there is a risk that the social protections we currently take for granted could be impacted by an exit from the EU. Now, the work undertaken by the members of the Standing Council has highlighted the extent to which an exit from the EU could create a gap between the current protections enjoyed across a range of areas, including employment law and human rights, and any future policy making in these areas out with the framework of the EU. So the Standing Council will be undertaking further analysis, engaging widely to ensure that Scotland's interests are protected in future relations, and to make sure that there is no regression from the current range of protections enjoyed by all citizens, as well as making sure that we continue to move forward, as obviously there is a European dynamic, both in social protection and in human rights. And the Standing Council benefits greatly from the input of Professor Alan Miller, who is, of course, a UN envoy on human rights. Question number five, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to develop tourism facilities on the North Coast 500 tourist route. The Scottish Government is a member of a multi-partner group recently established by Highlands and Islands Enterprise to lead on the strategic delivery of the opportunities offered by the North Coast 500. The main objective of the group, which includes the Highland Council and North Coast 500 amongst its membership, is to ensure economic benefits are spread across the North Highlands. The Scottish Government is also a key partner in the tourist, uh, tourist redevelopment of Inverness Castle, which acts as the start and finish point of the route and which will, when finished, encourage tourism throughout the Highlands. Rudy Grand. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the route um, has succeeded way beyond expectations and that has impacted on infrastructure. Will the Scottish Government help Highland Council fund essential maintenance and upgrades along the route to ensure that it's as safe as possible given that a lot of the route is still single track road? And will she also work with HIE to ensure that there's sufficient accommodation, something that is lacking in some of the smaller villages um, along the route to help cater for the increased visitor numbers? Cabinet Secretary. Well, success is a good thing to have, and uh, I'd like to congratulate everybody involved. That obviously brings with it challenges. Some of it is about promotion, some of it's about facilities, and clearly in relation to the transport issues that she's raised, I will bring them to, uh, to the attention of the Transport Minister. 
Question number six, Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent assessment is made of the impact of Brexit on Scotland's tourism industry. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we still don't, do not know what form of Brexit the UK Government seeks to pursue, and so therefore any impact assessment at this stage uh, is speculative. However, we continue to engage with the tourism sector to listen to its concerns, both for what this may mean for EU visitors to Scotland and the many EU citizens employed in the sector, nearly 17% of the total sustainable tourism workforce. I have discussed these issues uh, with industry bodies, including the Scottish Tourism Alliance and the British Hospitality Association. Uh, more recently, I met EU citizens at Deanston Distillery who work in tourism. Monica Lennon. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her reply. Scottish Labour would use the powers of the Scottish Parliament to give local authorities the ability to introduce a tourism tax locally, should they wish to. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that this devolution of power to local authorities, which would allow them to raise revenue from untapped streams, would be a welcome boost to Scotland's tourism industry following the Brexit vote? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I was working out what the connection to the Brexit vote was in that, in that uh, question. It's been raised uh, a number of times by a number of uh, Monica Lennon's uh, colleagues and, and previous colleagues. It's something that I know uh, some local authorities are, are keen on. I know it's something that the Labour Party are keen on. Um, there are issues, however. We are the highest uh, taxed tourism uh, country in uh, the whole of the, the second highest in the whole of the EU and so one of the issues about putting additional burdens onto the tourism sector uh, is problematic. It is possible now you don't need Brexit for the UK government to reduce VAT on tourism and if they would reduce VAT on tourism it may allow more flexibility uh, but at this point we've got very, very serious concerns about the level currently of uh, uh, taxation on the tourism sector. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, last year Scotland's first ever marine tourism strategy was published and there was a heavy emphasis placed upon increasing international tourists who sail. What would the implications be for Scotland's marinas if visa controls were instated uh, for current EU, EU uh, sailors and tourists arriving in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, clearly, again, this is one of the unknowns and the uncertainties of, of Brexit, but the suggestion of visa controls um, for visitors and indeed those like sailors who support the marine tourism industry of it is a very serious concern indeed. And these are the very practical issues that we're en engaged with in, in trying to identify what the implications are and trying to persuade the UK government to get into a position that's least worst in relation to Brexit. Question number seven, John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government for what reason the Mize Howe Cairn at Orkney UNESCO World Heritage Site has been closed without consultation. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government is very concerned about the closure of Mays Howe. I have expressed my concern to the Chair of Historic Environment Scotland, along with our support for an early resolution to mitigate the health and safety concerns for staff and visitors identified following a new assessment in August, triggered by their own decision to put on temporary hold the proposed infrastructure project. The care and management of Mays Howe is delegated by Scottish Ministers to Historic Environment Scotland, and they are also responsible under health and safety legislation for taking whatever steps are necessary to manage the safety of, and, of visitors and staff at properties they manage and of course that was a point uh, very forcefully made to me that uh, the Scottish Government should not interfere with direct operational decisions but I understand that they are in urgent discussions with Orkney Islands uh, Council about an early resolution. John Finney. Thank you very much. Uh, that's reassuring to hear the Cabinet Secretary's words. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that it's number four in the um, HES uh, visitor list um, and she may well be aware that locals have suggested a range, indeed four, alternative methods that could keep the, the site open. Um, I've had a number of representations and people are, are very concerned, not least because not only is it a UNESCO heritage but of course it's of significant part of the island's heritage, not least with the winter solstice coming up. Um, I'm glad that there has been that dialogue. May I ask that once again you go back and, and encourage uh, a situation which will ensure that educational visits can continue to visit that site. There are alternatives, it just needs the, the will of uh, Historic uh, Environment Scotland to do it, and your assistance would be appreciated, Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Historic Environment Scotland have been looking at this at some time. It's not just four options, there are actually five options were looked at previously, uh, but it, it clearly it involves discussion, uh, not just with Historic Environment Scotland, but others, including the Council, and anybody who's visited the site will know the speeds at which um, those uh, cars are 
travelling on the, on the neighbouring road. There have been 12 incidences uh, since March. So I understand the seriousness of this, but uh, we are working very constructively to a positive solution. Liam MacArthur. Thank you very much. Um, I certainly welcome the comments the Cabinet Secretary has made. Does she believe that the decision uh, to uh, announce this closure without any prior consultation has damaged HES's reputation uh, for partnership working? And while uh, efforts are ongoing between the Council and HES to reach a resolution, uh, will she ask that uh, the proposed closure on the 25th of this month is suspended pending the uh, outcome of those further discussions? Cabinet Secretary. A health and, clearly, a health and safety assessment was made uh, in August, and there was some time given to try and see what resolution could be done and mitigation. But I can't interfere with their operational issues, particularly in relation to health and safety. Um, but I do think that uh, we need to make, get resolution and constructive ideas about how to resolve it. It's a fantastic site. It's really important that we celebrate it and we have access both for educational and visitors. And, and I'll be doing everything I can in terms of encouraging both uh, Orkney Islands Council and Historic Environment Scotland to seek resolution. Can I thank members and ministers? We will now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 1554 in the name of Donald Cameron on NHS Scotland staffing crisis. I would invite all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons.